I have always been both a writer and visual artist. When I was at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, I kept changing my major from literature to art back and forth. I have had a word and image portfolio published in the Paris Review, and my poetry and art have been published in small literary journals. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, I have always considered myself first and foremost a visual artist. So how to combine the two? I gradually noticed that there were a fair amount of letters and words in some of the art of the Cubist period in France. I also realized that medieval manuscripts and Japanese ancient scrolls combined both word and image. In addition, the Dadaists and Surrealists truly wallowed in the word and image combination. So on these precedents, I decided to combine the two. I wanted my work's totality to look like thought processes made visible, scratching out words, some letters larger than others in the same word. It felt like an almost Dada-like flow of the way one thinks. I was paying homage to the scratchiness of the way the mind works. In any case, I soon realized that both words and images are communicators, and thus my choice often boiled down to, shall I use this color, or shall I write the word for this color? But again, as with the mind, my work becomes nonlinear in form, and as one would expect, I make art by the adage that Duchamp eloquently stated, it is the viewer who completes the work. Although paintings dominate the work that I do, my unique bookworks are an important contributor to the totality of my art making. This is because the material that I use is less orthodox than that of traditional painting. For example, I attach trinkets that I find in places like 99 cent stores and cast offs from old antique stores and toy stores, thread, wire, artificial flowers, and felt birds are incorporated into my bookworks. These materials encourage me to be more daring and playful in the composing of the work. Who could be serious using a child's plastic frying pan, albeit tiny, found in a toy store? It is then that I feel like Beckett's daughter, quote, move in, out of, back into, unquote. The objects and books take on a seriousness that one can only reach by being silly. Conversely, the paintings often inform the visuals of the book. I might decide to duplicate a tree. Of course, one could never truly duplicate something. The mark of the hand interferes, adding its own personality. However, by using serious subject matter, along with playful visual components, I put a spin on the work. There is a strain of meaning that only this juxtaposition can create. These are all unique books. As an aside, I created five edition books in the 70s and 80s. They were sold at museum shops here and abroad, including the Guggenheim and MoMA in New York City. Sadly, and happily, they sold out.
Although my colors are often scratchy and my images seem random, I do not align myself conceptually with being a New York City, or any other city for that matter, artist. If anything, I think of myself as being a psychologically based chronicler of mindful tales. As an aside, I have an apartment in Paris and before the COVID epidemic, traveled to Paris for a few weeks at a time, three to four times a year. However, I do not rule out the influence of urban cities visual aspect. I am fascinated with the passage of time and how the layering of past events inform the present, both psychologically and physically. As a child in the Bronx, I remember often walking with my hand against a wall and feeling the irregularities of the wall texture and the subtle changes of the wall color. I did not know then that this act would be a metaphor for my future art career. So the streets of Paris with its oft crumbling work surfaces and the streets of New York City with its graffiti surfaces and old next to new do influence me visually. But I also love natural landscapes of trees in bloom amidst rolling hills. There too exists a subtle variation of color, often from leaf to leaf, tree to tree. However, conceptually, the way the mind and our emotions work is the nexus of my art explorations. The hopscotch randomness of images kaleidoscoping in the viewfinder of my brain. The seeming lack of coherence in our dreams and our thoughts is fodder for my art. For in reality, there is an intrinsic perfection that is not linear of our inner life. As a child, I was not encouraged to acknowledge negative thoughts. And so my individual feelings were a little lopsided. 20 years of psychotherapy helped me overcome this and gave me a more realistic view of what I was experiencing in my life. I do think that most of us require, quote, a rest on the couch, unquote, from time to time. In conclusion, my art at its best is a valentine to one's whole, complete, and even a bit negative, truth and inner life. My wish is that the viewer engages with my work. I want the viewer to, in a sense, complete it with his or her own thoughts. This, as I previously mentioned, is how Duchamp defines the art experience. Quote, the viewer completes the work, unquote. There is no one right way to view my art. Each person has his or her own psychology and personal history that he or she brings to the work. One can get involved with the texture, painting surface, or color variation, or with the words by themselves. One can combine the two, the word and image, to find his or her own connections. But what I most want is for the viewer to appreciate the poetry of life and the glorious imperfection that in reality is perfect. Mm -hmm.